Wouldn't it be nice to have several thought leaders in your industry know and love your brand? Start a podcast. Invite your industry's thought leaders to be guests on your show and start reaping the benefits of having a network full of industry influencers. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome to the B2B Growth Podcast. I am Carlos Hidalgo, CEO of Vision CX and author of the newly released book, The Un-American Dream. And you are dialed into the human to human or hashtag H2H segment of the B2B Growth Podcast. And I'm so excited today to have with me as my guest, Tom Singer. Tom, welcome to the show. Hey, Carlos. Thank you so much for having me. So, Tom, you and I have had uh, many conversations, and uh, I'm not going to steal any thunder and try to intro you because you're going to do it better than I do. But you and I met, we were trying to, over lunch in Colorado Springs, I think in February of this year, we were trying to trace back like when we met. I know it was at a show. You were emceeing. I loved what you were talking about. And just in the years since then, as we have either commented on each other's tweets, I've been on your podcast, Cool Things That Entrepreneurs Do. We've had lunches. You are all about people and you have really invested in your career in A, becoming better at your own craft as, as just an individual. And we'll talk about a little bit about that. And then also this whole idea of potential. So for those who are listening, why don't you give a little bit background on yourself? And then I really want to dive into something that I am so intrigued by is this paradox of potential. Awesome. Well, yeah, I, uh, I've i spent over the last 10 years working as a professional speaker and master of ceremonies for corporate and association events, uh, sort of across industry lines. I believe you and I met at sort of a marketing-focused mm-hmm. uh, conference and probably early on in my career. I mean, that might be back towards 10 years ago. We're and then ourselves. Yeah, we're, we're getting older, man. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then we reconnected. I mean, we did follow each other sort of in that social uh, media world, but we did reconnect about four or five years ago. I had you on my podcast, Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do. You now have been a guest on that show three times, which uh, puts you almost up as like the most interviewed person in the history of now coming up on 500 episodes. So uh, yeah, but I'm just, like I said about myself, I'm I'm a professional speaker and master of ceremonies. I really like working with groups. I spent a lot of time focusing on this human-to-human engagement. Most of my career was around a program I called Connecting with People in a Gadget Crazy World. Uh, I always like to preface that with the fact that I am pro-gadget. I use all these tools that we are all so addicted to. But in order to really be successful, we have to get back to that person-to-person, belly-to-belly, sit down and have lunch or a beer, really get to know people. And then... Two years ago, I started researching something that came out of interviews that I was doing with entrepreneurs around success and around their teams. And everybody talked a lot about having people on their team or even their own personal story of having all this potential. And then what I realized through interviewing so many people is that potential is great. We get excited about it. But potential doesn't equal performance. Potential is not a result. And so that's what I'm focused on today. About 60% of my work is going into companies, uh, still also some associations, and talking about how do we get across the gap that exists between potential and results. So, Tom, and and when you talk about research, I want to be clear, you talk to over 500 individuals. And according to your own writing, you say that 70%, which is an extraordinary amount of people, have admitted that they are not 
doing all they can in their career. So talk to me a little bit about that. Did that, did that surprise you? Uh, was that kind of like mm, about what I expected or did that excite you to say, Hey, there's this greenfield opportunity here as business owners, as business leaders and entrepreneurs for us to really tap into that human desire. Cause I don't think anybody goes to work saying, Hey, I want to be marginal today. I think everybody wants to go in and really do their best. So how did that, how did that either inspire you, depress you, motivate, you. Talk to me about that. You know, I don't know if I had an expectation. And I always tell people, this is not scientific research. I'm not going to get a PhD because I'm asking people, how do you feel about your own personal potential? And how do you feel about the results you're getting? And you can't really do scientific research based on the way people feel. However, observationally, it has been phenomenal and really eye-opening. And what happens is, is I, I did sort of like a, an online survey, which over 500 people have now taken. And then I've interviewed probably about 10% of those people one-on-one. And what's interesting is when I can push the people who either say, yeah, I'm not really living up to my potential at work, or the people who say, yeah, I'm kicking ass, what I find out is that there's some very interesting traits in that. I don't know if I knew it would be 70% or not, but that number has held from when there were 100 people up to about 500 people now who've taken it. It hasn't changed very much. And when I talk to uh, business leaders, people who have employees, you know, they kind of nod their head. But, but then I always say, like when, when I'm speaking, I always say, let's say that I'm wrong with my numbers. You know, it's not scientific. Let's say my numbers are off. Let's say 50% of the people are well aware they're not doing everything they could do uh, in comparison to their potential, to the results they're getting at work. And then what if those are the people who work for you? What if 50% of your team is well aware of the fact they're coming up short and they have no idea what to do about it? And that's where the fun has really been for me is finding out what's holding people back and then coming up with things that people can put into practice that will help them get across this gap. Yeah, I love that. And I love that you've really honed in on the word potential. I'm a big sports guy. And I, uh, especially with my New York Yankees, I joke around that I don't watch the games. I actually work the games. And when you, when you follow sports and you, somebody gets drafted or that you get a, you get a lineup card and you're like, oh, this team has so much potential. And then they don't live up to that potential. It's such a letdown. And I've also got to imagine it's a letdown for the players. So in that, you write uh, on LinkedIn, you, you had a post talking about the uh, unlock potential. And one of the lines you have in there, which I love, it says, to get results, you have to be intentional. So how do you build intentionality into an individual who is admitting, I'm not really giving 100% of myself or 100% to this task or this discipline, what I'm being paid for, or even as an entrepreneur, maybe what I started. So how do you build that in somebody or can, can that even be built? I believe it can, but part of it is, is everyone involved has to be honest about it, the, from the manager to the individual to the whole team. And so when I get brought in to speak to a company, one of the things the sales manager or whoever chooses me to come in and be the presenter, one of the things they sort of secretly want, or sometimes they even say it in, in their own terms, is they want me to build a bridge across the gap from potential to results, and they want me to put all of their people on a bus and just drive them across. Everyone is out there looking for a simple answer to how do we get more results? How do we, right. how do we drive our peak performers to perform more? But it's not, there's no magic fairy dust that we can sprinkle because if you've got a team, and I'm just making it for easy round numbers, if you've sure. got a, a team of 10 people, Each person on the team, even if they're all good performers and even if they all have potential, they have different things that are holding them back. They have different strengths. They have different personal lives and desires. And so you can't put everybody on one bus and drive them across because nobody has just one thing that holds them back. But most people have two, three, four. And and I've identified like there's more, but I've identified 10 things that most people say, yeah, here's what's holding me back. But on your team, it's not the same three things for everybody. So you can't just have one solution. The other thing is you can't build that bridge across the gap because here's the thing. We want to drive all the way across the gap, but I'm going to tell you a secret, Carlos. You're never going to reach all your potential. And, hmm. and don't, tell your, don't tell your mom that. She'd be very <laughs> But here's what happens. Life isn't static. It's it's fluid. So as you go through the journey of your life and your career, you're going to read a new book like The Un-American Dream, or you're going to listen to a new podcast like Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do, or you're going to hear a speaker, or you're going to get an advanced degree, or you're going to get a certification. Your potential is going to shift. 
So if we built a bridge, you'd fall into to the abyss. So we have to build what I call a scaffolding. And I use that as sort of a mental picture. Think of a scaffolding. It's modular. It's low to high. It comes in pieces. If your potential shifts, you just add another unit to the scaffolding. And then you allow your team members to get out there on that scaffolding and at their own pace, move across the gap. Now, some people, when they figure out what's holding them back and they find some solutions, they're going to rock it across. They're just going to get out there hand over hand. They're going to go right across as far as they can. Other people are going to go up and down or diagonal. Some people are going to get out there, look down and go, ah, and not do much for a while. But it's having everybody understand that it's okay that we're different and that we're supportive as a team and we show each other the way across. So if people choose, I'm going to go out on the scaffolding, then they're intentional. And then it's just a matter of taking the steps that work for them to move out as far across the gap as they possibly can. And what I've found is, is that when I put it this way, I had one CEO tell me, you hit a reset button in my people because it was so simple for them, but everybody was looking for the magic bullet and they thought there was one answer. When all of a sudden, everybody realized they had their own issues and they had their own solutions and they looked at supporting it. He said it was like a whole reset button for the team. So, and it sounds like in that in that instance, and I like what you said is you know some people are are going to move at a faster pace, but there's then that communal aspect of yes. hey, I'm moving faster, but then there's Carlos who who may not be moving faster, maybe have some fear trepidation, all of things which are human, very human feelings. I'm actually going to help that individual come across as well because when I am meeting my full potential. And correct me if I'm wrong, or if you saw this in any of the the uh, interviews you've done or some of the research you've done, if I'm hitting all of my strides and, and what I feel is meeting in that moment, my full potential, doesn't that kind of become contagious? I want to see other people also reach their fullest potential. It becomes contagious. You become a role model. You can become a leader. And you have to also reach your hand back and give them mm. that safety net to be able to move move farther across. But you hit on a key word, and that was communal. Because I spoke to a, a large construction company, their whole team, I don't know, about 200 people. Mm. And at the break, it was like a three-hour workshop. At the break, one of the managers, one of the senior uh, team members came up to me and said, I love the example of the scaffolding. And he looked at me and goes, do you have a construction background? And I was like, no. And he goes, do you know what's beautiful about that example? And I was like, please, please tell me. And he said, you can't build scaffolding alone. I mean, you could, but it would be really hard and it may not be Uh as safe. You need a team of two, three, four people to erect scaffolding. And then you have a safety officer who comes around and checks to make sure the bolts are in place and things like that. So in order to, to have your team work across this scaffolding, it is a communal effort. And then he added something that I, I think is great. And he said, here's the other thing. A scaffolding is a temporary structure. We build it to complete a yes. task and we take it down. And he said, then when it's time to do renovations, you put up a new scaffolding. And I thought, wow, that totally sums up what we're trying to do here. Right. Yeah. Cause you, you don't want to get stuck at a point where you go, Oh, I've reached my potential. Um, because then what you're really saying is, Oh, if I've reached my full potential, then I I've got it all figured out. There's never room for growth. There's never new for learning. So I love, I love that example. And I learned something because I don't have a construction background, tried to fake it in a few summer jobs in college, but clearly <laughs> it, uh, it didn't stick. So Tom, you talked about 10, uh, tips or 10 things that uh, everybody should look at to reach or unlock that potential. And we don't have time. We could probably do a whole other podcast and break it down like five by five. But quickly, what are those 10 if you just want to rifle through them? And then really talk about, are there some that are a little bit more important than others? Or are there some that, you know, hey, you really need to start here in order to fully unlock that potential that is hiding within all of us? Absolutely. And, and, and there are a series of different things that hold different people back. And so the first thing we do is we go through and we identify what is it that people feel is holding them back. And some of those things are fear. Some of it, people mm-hmm. feel they don't have the right network. Sometimes people feel they're not getting the support at work or they don't have the right training. So there's a whole series of things. But then these answers or these tips, they sound very simple. Like if I was just to show you the list and you, know, you were a seasoned entrepreneur, you might go, well, duh. And then right. my, my answer is, but look closely at them. Does everybody on your team do all 10 of these things? No, your, your performers, especially your peak performers do most of these, but even the best people you have have areas where they're weak. So just going through them really, really quick, and then I'll focus in on the two or three that I think really 
are the most impactful with the audiences that I speak to. Number one is you have to take ownership of your own life. You, you can't be pointing fingers. Number two is you have to set clear goals. I'm a huge believer that if you know what success looks like and you're working towards it, it just makes it easier to answer the tough questions that come up. You just decide, sure. does this action bring me closer to the goal or farther from the goal? Number three is you have to work past the fear because we all get scared in our careers. There's things, whether right. you're the entrepreneur or you're an employee. Uh, number four, connect with people. I've been teaching networking skills and, and connection for a decade. And I think that that is so important. Uh, number five is you have to be aggressive with your gratitude. We live in a world right now where a thank you seems to be optional and, and the people who seem to get the farthest appreciate the people who help them along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, number six, I added because people said, well, some of these things are fluffy and you don't understand my industry. In my industry, you have to do good work. Well, yeah, in all industries, you have to do good work. <laughs> but number six is you have to do good work and deliver on your projects because all of this other stuff, if, if you're doing schlocky work, won't matter if you're not doing a good job. And, right. and number seven, we live in a world that's full of change. I mean, 10 years ago, the economy fell out around all of us and it caught a lot of people unexpecting that we could have that kind of a recession. Well, the people who succeeded through it accepted that, all right, we have a recession. I'm going to accept it. Change has happened. Now, what do I do? And, and that's how I launched my career. Number eight is ask for help. Uh, I think that lots of times people forget that we don't live in a Lone Ranger society. We need other people. Number nine is going to be one that I'm going to go into with a minute because I think it's the most important, and that is try new things. And I'll, I'll talk more about that for sure. And then the 10th one is believe in yourself because if you don't believe in yourself, uh, no one else is going to really do it for you. So those those 10 things are sort of the framework of, of what we can do to get out of this paradox around potential and actually move across that gap. And if I was to pick three that I think really, really made a difference for people. I'm going to say I would start with work past the fear. Okay. I talk to people all the time who say that they're scared. I thought it was just fear of failure. But what I've learned in this and talking to all these people is some people are fear, are scared of the unknown. They would love yeah. to do a management job, but they've never managed people. So they're scared to do it and thus they turn it down or they don't put their name in the hat or they really want to go start their own business. It's a calling to them from the inside but they're scared of what happens if they don't make money and they let the fear of, will I lose the house? Will people laugh at me take over? And so you don't want to make stupid decisions, but fear is, is a natural emotion that's there to protect us. And if you go back thousands of years, there were dangers we don't face today. Like if you walked outside, a tiger could eat you. For most of us, that's not going to happen. However, our body doesn't know the difference when it releases the hormones that are involved with fear. It's life and death versus asking your boss for a raise and maybe you don't get it. Our body doesn't necessarily notice the difference between those two, but one, you die, and one, you don't get the raise. So right. we have to learn to just work past the fear if it's not going to kill us or totally derail us. So I think that one is extravagantly important. Uh, the second one I would pick on here would be connect with people. And I think that all opportunities in life come from people and we get so busy. We are caught up in a world where we use busy as an excuse not to do a lot of things. And one of the major things people don't do is go to lunch with somebody or go to a networking event or attend a conference because they're like, oh, I'm just too busy. I think we're using busy as a faux badge of honor, sort of a fake honor system. 100%. And I think what's happening is people are bragging on how busy they are. So you go, hey, you know, I'd love to meet you for lunch when I'm in Colorado Springs. And people go, oh, I would love to, but I'm so busy. I don't have 10 minutes in my day. I can't take 45 minutes to, you know, to go to the B with you for lunch. Well, then you never develop that relationship with the person who might be the one who opens a door for you three years later. And you don't know because you were so busy and you were so proud that you turned people down. I have people all the time who they go, I am so proud of how many people I say no to. People want to pick my brain and buy me coffee and I just say no. Well, that mm -hmm. means you didn't meet really interesting people at all. Now, you can't, right. can't just have your brain picked, but you have to be open to crossing paths with other humans if you want opportunities. So I think that one's uh, one that we have to give a focus to in a world where there's so many distractions. And then the last one that I'll, I'll just kind of dive deep here that I think is really important for everyone listening is that number nine that I mentioned, and that is try new things. I realized something about myself in the last three years of, of interviewing people about potential, talking to CEOs and other executives who've been extravagantly successful. And that is, I spent a lot of my life with my ladder against the wrong wall, mm. only doing things I felt really comfortable doing. Like I felt I was good at it. So I did that. So my sales and marketing career, 
I was really good at it. I got paid well. I was successful. I won awards. I did, you know, uh, won trips or whatever you get when you're in sales. And that stuff was awesome, except for the fact that I really wanted to be doing something for myself. I wanted to be more creative. I wanted to, to call the shots and I was too scared to do it. I didn't believe in myself, all this other stuff. But the other thing is I never even tried. I didn't, I didn't stick my toe in any waters. I, I said no to opportunities that were out of my comfort zone. And three years ago, I changed all that. Part of it, so how did you do that? What did you do to change that? Well, a lot of it came from this research of when I watched people who were succeeding, they were saying, if, you, if you're getting results you're not happy with, you have to take different actions. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I turned 50, I made a life commitment that I was going to make age 50 to 75 the best years of my life. And I've had a pretty good life. So this was a challenge. Right. And, and what I did is I adopted this whole motto of try new things. And so when opportunities come to me and people ask me to do something, I try to find a way to say yes rather than no. In my career as a speaker, as a master of ceremonies, I've had clients come and say, uh, we're going to do away with the keynote speaker. We're going to do a three-hour moderated luncheon uh, where people are going to talk about topics. Could you be the host of that? Well, years ago, I would have been like, no, that's not what I do. I bring content in and I talk. My answer was, sure. And then we designed mm -hmm. this thing and I've, that particular association has hired me three times to lead this big 300 to 1,000 person discussion at their conferences instead of having a keynoter. Well, that's been awesome. If I had keynoted for them, I would have done it one year and they would have had somebody else. But I said, let's play. Let's try. Mm -hmm. So in my career, I'm willing to do things that I may not have done before. I, I would have previously said, nope, I am this. And then in my personal life, and you know some of this, uh, I've done a couple things. One is I'm a city kid. So I always traveled to Chicago, New York, Seattle. Uh, now my vacations are the Grand Canyon, uh, Yosemite, uh, and my daughter and I are going to hike the Appalachian Trail for six months in four years or five years when she graduates college. So I've become sort of outdoorsy, which was never my thing. And now on the weekends, you can find me on the hike and bike trails around Austin, Texas, you know, doing two and three hour nature walks. So that has expanded a lot for me that I never knew was, was there. And then... Right. Uh, I'm scared of heights, so I, I went uh, zip lining at Pikes Peak. You know, I've done all this different stuff, and then sort of the the, the big one is I took up stand up comedy at 51 years old, and in the last year, I have done 52 open mic nights and been invited to do several comedy shows as one of the featured comics, and that was scary as could be. I wasn't any good at it. Now I'm okay at it, I guess, but it's making me a better speaker. And it's also making me more fearless and willing to try new things in everything else I do. Because I will tell you, stand-up is one of the hardest and scariest things you can ever go do. Oh, I could, I could imagine. And you and I talked about this at lunch because I think I'm hilarious. And um, <laughs> I, have, I have thought about that. And you actually challenged me and said, and full disclosure, so has my daughter who's 19 years old, like, so, okay, so when are you going to stop talking about it and actually do it? So you've actually been inspirational. So I love that try new things. And when I look at that, for me, and again, I don't know that you designed it this way, that is kind of like the linchpin in all of this. So you talked about asking for help, accepting change happens. Well, when I think about trying new things, how about actually saying, hey, make change happen, change something in your life. And then getting back to that, work past that fear. I think fear is is so paralyzing, even for those of us like ourselves who, you know, we're not entrepreneurs in the realm of Zuckerberg and those guys. But I would say in looking at our careers, Tom, we, we've been successful. And that there are still days where I have fear of, oh my word, is this going to make me look bad? Is this going to, you know, if I lose this or if, if this happens, how embarrassing. And so I kind of look at all of that try new things is saying, try new things with your mental mindset, put yourself out there a little bit, try new things by not getting stymied by fear. I mean, is that the design or am I reading too much into it? Or is it kind of going, hey, Carlos, for you, this is how it resonated. And for others, it may resonate differently. No, I think you're right on the money. It is the piece that has resonated the most with people. So I started selling shirts that say, try new things. And <laughs> I, I have little stickers I pass out when I, when I do the speech. Uh, one of my repeat clients who is having me for the third year in a row, they've, they've had me do the networking talk. They've had me do the paradox potential. Uh, I'm coming back as their master of ceremonies and they want me to do like a 30 minute breakout. And she goes, could you do a whole half hour on the try new things? Because that's what everybody loved about last year's talk in the paradox of potential. Everybody loved the part about trying new things. And so I'm writing it up as a half hour 
talk on just how when you get out there and try things, it means different things for different people. Not everyone's going to go do stand-up. Not everybody's going to go zip lining off Pike's Peak. However, if you are getting results that you're not happy with, if you feel I'm capable of more, my potential is higher than what I'm doing, and you're not attempting different actions, you're not going to get different results. It's, right. it's that old saying about, you know, if you keep doing the same thing, you're going to get the same results. Well, yeah. It's called insanity. Is yeah. that, that's the it's clinical right. definition. That's right. That's right. So, so let me let me bring this really practical to our audience because I, I work with marketing, B2B marketing and salespeople all the time. We're on the B2B growth podcast. And if you look at the research and in the people that I talk to, they go, oh, well, we're just, you know, we're, we're running more campaigns or we're creating more content or we, we've bought more technology and it's more, more, more. And what it really is, is the same thing. We're just throwing more money and more stuff at it. And then they launch it and go, oh, well, crap. That didn't produce anything else. Hey, we need to throw even more at it. And there's a few who say, hey, we really, in our organization, we want to be a change agent. But we also know, either from our executives, our peers, my, my immediate boss, there's this fear of, okay, well, we're going to change. What happens if nothing you know, nothing moves. What happens if we get worse? So how would you tell a, a change agent, a B2B marketer, B2B salesperson who wants to drive change, who wants to try new things and really see individually and organizationally them reach the potential? How do they then instill that in their peers and their management and their executive team? Well, I mean, if you just go down the list of the 10 things I read, that that ties itself to marketing campaigns as well. You got to take ownership of it. Some of them aren't going to work. Mm -hmm. I, I worked for a company at one time in my life and it was a services company. I was the director of marketing and I pitched a campaign that I wanted to do and it was moderately expensive for this little company. They'd never done anything like it before. And the owner said, what is the guaranteed ROI? And I said, <laughs> well, you know, I can't guarantee the ROI. I think this is going to work. And here's why I think it's different than any of our competitors have done, right? And she slammed her hand down and said, I said, sometimes you have to throw a little spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. And it hit a nerve with her. She threw her hand on the table and said, in my company, no spaghetti hits the floor. And I said, well, then you're never going to have great marketing. You're going you're right. to be able to copy what everyone else in the industry does. And everyone's going to smile and feel good that you did the right thing. You know, but you're never going to have it blow blow the doors out. And this, I right. work a lot with lawyers, and law firms are very good at looking what other law firms do for marketing and then just doing it. So years ago, I was working with a firm, and, and they noticed their competitor had a diorama, one of these posters in the airport. And they were like, oh, all the business people fly. They all see that poster. That must be the best marketing. So I went to the marketing person for that firm and asked, how successful is that? And she goes, oh, I hate it. It's grossly expensive. But one of our partners represents the company who does all the on-site advertising. There you go. Report. And so we have to buy that ad because they're a huge client. And she said, we get nothing from it. Well, all the other law firms assumed it was great marketing and were willing to plump down you know, $100,000 a year to copy it. Well, the reality right. was they were doing it because they had to, not because it produced results. And I think that's where you have to get, if you're, you know, you're, that's what your life's going to be like if you're just copying what your competitors are doing. They might be doing it for the wrong reasons or they might be stupid. So don't just copy them. You know, carve your own path. You know, and it doesn't mean abandon what's working for you. Right. But if, if you want to have a big win, throw some spaghetti against the wall. I love that. I love that. Tom, I, I literally could, I know we don't have the time. I could go at least another hour picking your brain about this. I think you have, and I've, I've read a lot, you and I've had, I've been fortunate enough to have the conversations with you about this. I think you have hit on something that is so needed in the marketplace. So if people who are listening who go, boy, this really resonated with me, how do people get a hold of you? How do they learn more? How do they get in touch with Tom Singer to, so they can start to help unlock their own potential? Well, thank you for the opportunity to, to share that. When I go into companies and do this potential talk, I, I loved the term, the reset button. People nod their head and go, this is what we've been looking for. And then we start discussions for that team. 
you know, nothing changes in a day, but it starts an ongoing discussion that they can then put into practice and, and make happen and get, get to results for themselves. So if people want to have this conversation with me and possibly have me come in and talk to their team or at a conference they're putting on, they can find everything about me at tomsinger.com. I spell it T-H-O-M-S-I-N-G-E-R.com. They can find me on all the social medias and they can listen to my podcast at Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do. And I'm always willing just to have a conversation. So if, if anyone's listening who has their own podcast, I like being a guest on podcasts too. And sometimes people are like, oh, I don't want to bother you. Ah, bother me. I'll try a new, I'll try your podcast. That's a new thing. And I can, I will vouch for Tom. I can tell you that uh, in the years I've known Tom, he's the real deal. He does reach out. He connects better than almost anybody I've interacted with. And it's not a connection of, hey, let's just connect because I'm here and this is what I'm supposed to do because I tell people to do. It's a real genuine connection. Tom, I appreciate our continued uh, conversations. I appreciate our continued, uh, the, the relationship we continue to build. And I just appreciate you trying new things and coming on this B2B growth podcast and sharing the paradox of potential. So thank you so much for your time. Well, well thank you. And everybody should go buy your book, The Un-American Dream. I agree. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Thank everybody you. have a great day. I appreciate you listening to the human to human hashtag H2H segment of the B2B growth podcast. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast, and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three.